Well, I'm delighted with the opportunity, John, to be over here on this, the 50th anniversary year of Our Lady in St. Brendan's Church. It's hard to believe that we're here 50 years later, and uh, it's before my 10, 1970, when it all began. It's great to be here and just to be able to mark this occasion of the 50th anniversary of the church itself. The very first meeting uh, to begin the process of organising the fundraising took place on the 13th of September 1965 and the um, elected committee, Con Casey, was the chairman of that committee and then it was about two years later that they appointed Dan Kennedy as the architect in, uh, I think it was October of 1967 and then there's a lot of toing and froing with what sort of kind of a church would it be and about six months later, in the beginning of 1968 they decided on the design that we have here today which was a very unusual design at the time and then the work itself began on the, uh, January 1969 and obviously concluded then in 1970, late 1970. So it's just a timeline, like it takes about five or six years from beginning to collecting, appointing the architect, agreeing the design until the dedication of the church in October of 1970. It takes us back to 1970 and when Diana won the Eurovision and it's hard to believe that 50 years we're here to mark this occasion. For other churches, 50 years is nothing. I mean, St. John's is celebrating its 150th this year. So it's a very short history. But nevertheless, it's a certainly a big milestone for the people of this community and for the people of this side of the town as well. Looking back over the years, I was appointed to Our Lady in St. Brendan's in July of 2009, which was 11 years ago. And over the course of time, I suppose there have been different memories, I think particularly of our 40th anniversary in 2010, which was an important year after the refurbishment of the church itself. But I think more so the, the mission we had in 2012 was a great community event a great week of celebration, of faith renewal, bringing people together. That was certainly a wonderful memory for me in my time here. One of the, the great advantages um, of being in this parish is that there's only one church. And like what happens in the parish happens in the church here from that point of view. And it's a great focal point. It's a focal point because older people remember it for all the memories it has of Joni's Field, Mulchers Corner and that community aspect that was ever here before the church was built. But since then, I suppose it's the focal point of celebrations like weddings, baptism, but I think particularly funerals over the years. There have been many significant funerals of people that had a big role in the community. And to be here in this part is another important aspect of what parish and community is all about. And for me, that, that I suppose, yes, it's about faith and it's about religion, but it's also about bringing people together, sharing their story of life living together, working together, and it certainly is an important role in the community. Also with us here is Thig McMahon, who grew up across the street. Uh, he was in short pants when the church was opened. Jerry Casey, who usually is with glaciers for funerals, but Jerry actually attended the first mass here in October of 1970. And Michael O'Donnell, his most significant moment was the day he got married here in St. Brendan's Church. And the church is most significant ceremony as well in his eyes. So it's great to have the three of them here sharing their memories and their stories. Is the roof designed as an upturned boat, Father? Or have you any... Uh... I, don't, I don't think it was set out to be designed that way, but when it was put together, it has that look about it. Yes, yeah. It does, it looks... Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It does, I, I, I thought it was something maybe that they actually did in <laughs> honour of St. Brendan, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. That was the story we heard, you know. That... I'd say it's a public, that was a public coincidence, I would say. I don't think Dan Kennedy decided to make it look like an upside down boat. I grew up here, I lived in uh, 18 Oven Terrace, which is now known as the Street of Champions because of its connections with the famous All Ireland footballers. Um, in those, there are 20 houses in the terrace, and uh, out of those 20 houses, uh, there are 21 All Ireland medals have been won over a span of 14 years. Uh, you had um, Gad Slattery, uh, Roundy and Porty Landers, Bill Landers, uh, Coxy Gorman, and I don't know if I've left anybody out or not now, but the 21 medals anyhow. And um, the, the, the Stax team at that time uh, did their training in Garrett Cotter's pitch, which is up the road here now from St. Brendan's Church. Um, there's a course that has been taken over now with the, the building of um, the, an estate of houses, um, Gallows Fields Field estate. So Garrett's is no longer, no longer there, but there are great memories of that pitch and the older people remember it very much. Um, 
the, the uh, we moved down then from Garrett Cottersfield down to um, what? Well, sorry, uh, before they went to Garrett Cottersfield, before my time as well, they were in in where the Greyhound track is now. That was Barrett O'Leary's field, and that's where they had their first training grounds. So um, I don't know whether Mikey you would know. Or Joe, you would know about that. Were they Hillsfield as well below? I'd, I'd there? say Hillsfield was it was mentioned, all right, but yeah, I don't know. For a bit, they, like. for a bit, yeah. They were in various places. They were in various places. Yeah, they were in various places around. They, they, like. they, 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 um, this is the field that of most significance oh, for us. Oh, yeah. of course, because yes. it has most memories here. For us, yeah. yeah, for our generation, yeah, yeah. we'll Especially say. Especially yeah. Johnny Connell and Rory. Jo Johnny and, and Rory. Yeah, yeah. Johnny's field was was um, owned by her. By Joni and Rory were brother and sister, obviously, and um, their mother had come in from Lexna, I think it was, and they bought this this ground here. And I think they gave the place almost rent free as well. They were really, they, I mean, it was it meant a lot to the community. This field, uh, tied, didn't it? Oh, it did. Yeah, well, uh, the, the, the Stacks Club like rented the field, and I I I, I remember distinctly where uh, each each year. Um, they were definitely paid because yeah. John, John, not, was, not, <laughs> not, not, not an awful lot of tax. Johnny wouldn't give away anything. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny was a very nice person, great character, yeah, yeah. but she would uh, uh, make sure that the rent yeah, was paid. Yeah. The rent you know, was paid, yeah. Yeah. But, um, she had an old donkey and car, and uh, she'd go down to the creamery every day with the donkey and car, and it could be maybe well into the afternoon before she'd get home. She'd visit a few places on her way. It was Father Scott was the priest that time, and uh, coming up to the church that time, they were collect there was a collection out of every house in town for a shilling a week they used to give. Some people might give it two shillings, like. It was on the wages that time. But that night, uh, you had Bishop Casey, and there was a good chair, a priest, at the service that night, piling nuns, and... Uh, Massive crowd all together. It was a great occasion tonight. It opened. I have good memories of all the priests were here. We had great priests here over all the years. Like uh, a lot of them have left us now. They've gone to their reward. Like, but uh, they were always nice priests. Like, we never had a cranky priest here. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> My father was reared there in Urban Terrace in Rock Street, and I was reared in Brindens Park. So, as a young fellow, we were brought down here. There was a wall across here, there was a river running down there as well, and there would be matches every night of the week here, a football match. And uh, as I just said to Ty that time, Brindis Park have a team against the Stacks at night, like, and there'd be fa some fair slashing in that, like. Been the, Kevin, the Kevin Barry Cup was a local... Yeah, local that time, league. like, you know, and uh, you had all the, the good for this flat now those times, like. So it used to be a great night, like, there'd be matches seemed to be every night of the week here, like. So you had a football match here and you'd have a basketball match above the, uh, in the park there every night. They'd be coming from Dublin, Cork every in those days. The Stacks didn't win a championship from 19, 1936 until 73. But they, were, they always put out a team in the, in the county championship. There was always football, you know. Oh, there was always. It was and the characters, uh, I can go names down through the years, it's amazing. Um, but they put out a hurling team as well. Just right? have hurling. The, the, the hurling was very strong. Yeah. A lot of people maintained that, uh, the success of the hurlers in the early 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, brought on the, the football team because the Stacks went into two finals. They were beaten, as John Barry will tell you, uh, they were beaten by Pint uh, in the final on two occasions. Um, so the, the, they were very, very unlucky. Um, as well as that, uh, with, their, with their association as well, with the Greyhound track, they used to do the ticket selling, they'd sell the tickets. And I understand that the money they got for selling the tickets was the money that Johnny got for the rent of the field, you know. So there was a connection there as well. And Rory was the, was the man that ran the, he was the, um, the controller of the starting box in the track, that was his job. And uh, he was doing that doing that for years, yeah. as you know. And there was another, there was another brother, Jack. Didn't know Jack. Jack. He came home from Australia, now the stories yeah. I heard about him. He was a, a right character altogether, like, yeah. just there. And Rory was, they were, of course, they were all into the grounds. 
But there was a strong greyhound tradition as huge, well. Huge, huge. Could be nothing strange to see fellas walking greyhounds here. Oh, Every, everybody, uh, everybody in the rock had a greyhound, you know. But just at that time, now when we were young, you'd come down, we'd come down here to what you call it, Kerbile, and you'd walk the dogs for him in the evening, and you'd walk around the field here, and you'd get a penny at the end of the week for walking the dogs for right, him. Yeah. Just there. Yeah. And there was a rush down to get the dogs. And of course, the other tradition was that. Um, a man rang me lately and he said to me, where's the, the holy water tap gone? And I said, what holy water tap are you talking about? He said, there was always a holy water tap at the back of the church. I used to fill up my bottle there. I said, you haven't filled your holy water a long time because that tap has gone for 10 years. <laughs> so I think it was taken out of the time because um, while it served the purpose of holy water for the faithful, it also served the purpose of washing down the dogs either be be before the race to help them win and after the race if they were successful. So yeah, yeah, another I'd part of the right. folklore. <laughs> I'd say you're right. <laughs> Actually, the, having said about Joan, you know, mm. being not uh, free with the rent, uh, she was uh, she left Kerbyl in the in situ yeah. as long as he lived. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, do you, are you familiar with that story, no. Father? Yeah. Well, he was. Uh, Although she gave the field to the church, yeah. it was part of the conditions of of the sale or the handover oh, yeah. that Kerboyle could stay with his greyhounds as long as he wanted oh, to. Yeah. 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 Which, he know, did. which he did. Which he did. Yeah. Which yeah. he did. Which yeah. he did. And I suppose that that people wouldn't be familiar with that part, Michael. Is that when you go to the gate and at uh, facing the Oakview graveyard on the left hand side that's where all that happened yeah and it's only in recent yeah. times that that was demolished yeah. and the law was put back yeah. there and yeah, yeah. there's a yeah. plaque actually there uh, there is Rory <laughs> but I suppose John the biggest thing here was we had a very happiness thing and it ended up a very sad thing we had an ordination it was the first ordination here Father Mitosk the cure is here and uh, Father Sean Hannafin, Father Patsy Lynch and Father Lucid Father O'Mahony, they were at the end here that day, and uh, June 74, and poor Father Mitroski, I suppose he was so excited when it just nearly finished, didn't he drop dead? And that was a very sad, it ended up a very mm. sad thing that on day. On his ordination? Sir. On the ordination saw, yeah. of Sean Hannafin that day. Oh, yeah. And actually he came from down in Castle Street, he, and his father walked in Dinnies, mm -hmm. Father Mitroski's. Well, the, the, and the other sad thing about that was that, um, and I hope he doesn't mind me telling it, but Father Sean Hannafin got a present of a set of vestments for his ordination. And when he went into the sacristy the following day to prepare for his first Mass, there was no sign of the vestments. He discovered that Father McCluskey was laid out in them. Oh my <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. <laughs> so it's about being the right time at the right place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So they mentioned that, yes, there, there's the plaque just and the, near the door of the church which marks the dedication of the church with the design by Dan Kennedy and the building by the Fitzgerald brothers that were the contractors at the time. And then, as Tyke right. mentioned, down near the other gate is the plaque in memory of Rory O'Connell. That's right. Yeah. And, and yeah. his, his yeah. time there. There was very few houses up along Mona Valley, but at the time, Brendan's Park was built in the 50s, mm -hmm. and then Condé Park was built in the, in the 60s as well. So there was a lot of housing development going on. And if you look at the town, that St. John's was very much on that side of the town, and maybe it was trying to cater for this part of the town, the countryside spreading in. I think Carcelli, Father, was... Carcelli was just starting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. so, yeah. mm -hmm. But there was great foresight in choosing the site because I looked up, it was about three and a quarter acres. And the idea was, that even at that stage, that there would be sufficient space to build a church, as well as building a presbytery and maybe a centre nearby. So that was pretty advanced foresight when they considered the, 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 the parish centre. It wasn't built until 1990, which came over 20 years later. And at the time, again, it's trying to remember that there was two priests appointed to the church in 1970, Father Peter Scott and Father Tom Hickey. And they were out of St. John's Parish and they lived in Omar, as we were saying that earlier, over in Brewery Road. They were in digs there, there was no presbytery. And it was only a number of years later that the house in the corner where Richie Hurley has his uh, practice now, that became the presbytery in later times. Um, and obviously then, some years later, the presbytery was built and the centre, that was in 1990. So it's a lovely, spacious, open, I yeah. mean, lighted area, isn't yeah, it? it is. really? Of course, yeah. for, for parking yeah. as well, now today, if you haven't got pa parking, you're, you're very limited. What's the usual first about the, the, the roof itself is that there's no internal pillars, which gives view from any place in the church, and it's, I suppose, 
so from that point of view, it was a pretty remarkable achievement to have such a span and the copper roof and the copper roof was, I suppose, because of the weight and the span, it was the only possible roof. And what happened then is that as time went by, uh, under the, the copper roof, they had chipboard, which in time disintegrated. And, you know, so a big job took place then. It began doing conversation with my predecessor, Father Danny Broderick, and then the signing of the contract. And that roof was put on 20, 2009, 2010, as well as all the work in the car park. Um, and previous to that, in, if you look at the old photographs of 1970, the mass the jury was at, there was actually no rear dress or, or backdrop behind the altar itself. It was a, it was a very open, bland sort yeah. of thing. Mm -hmm. And it was then in Father Hogan's time oh, yes. that they put in the, the backdrop as we have it today with the tabernacle and the, the significance of the, the part in the waters and the hanging banners. And they were painted by a lady called Vicky Crowley, living up in Barna in County Galway. And we brought her back then in 2016 because the banners had got very tired. There were silk banners and they were tired and faded. And she was moving on in years. She was in her 70s at that stage, still alive. But a fantastic artist that she had the artistic ability, but the theological insight as to what it might be. So she redid them in 2016 on different material. And they're certainly very vibrant and add to the, the design of this church as well. With the pastoral centre, of course, that it gave great opportunities over the years for different courses and that has changed. And like for us ourselves now up to recently, there will be the different groups like we have mother and toddler group, mothers and young mothers with their babies and breastfeeding course run for that. Club Eden, the active retired group, other people in for counselling, back care, Pilates, mindfulness, a whole range of activities. So it's a great asset and being beside the church it certainly complements one complements the other as a facility. And it's, re it's a real parish centre. Yes. Oh, it is a real parish centre. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, yeah, it is, yeah. Some people might ask, how much did it cost? And I think the original estimate was about £90,000. And by the time it came to being finished, uh, I think the final sum was about 110000 with extra costs and increased costs and all that kind of thing. So, Which wasn't the expensive. Sounds nothing now. It no. sounds nothing now, yeah. no. Probably cost you that to get an architect today. That in mind yeah. to build it. Yeah. yeah. Paddy Braston yeah. and his association yes. with yeah. the church, and he only died. Yeah. It was this year, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Paddy was a pillar of the church. And yeah. you know, um, Paddy Garvey cutting the grass Paddy, here, and yeah. people that contribute to yes. the, the, the success of a church, yes. really. In I was yeah. talking to Paddy the other day, and he's still, I think Paddy celebrated his. 90s. Did he? Yeah. And you, you should go back. You're Chucky O'Connell. You are. Well. Uh, Gar Ferry, he lived across the road here. Right, yeah. And he became the parish clerk. He was the first parish clerk to I come see. in here to look after this. Yeah. And he was the first funeral in here. Mike. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was yeah. the first yeah. funeral in here. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah. they just lived across the Mike there. mentioned um, Paddy Brasson. Paddy, would, many would have known, worked on the railway and uh, himself and, and his wife Mary Ellen who died uh, five years ago but Paddy was a, a great stalwart to the parish serving mass here we said he's the oldest altar boy in Ireland he was serving mass for I think it was it 47 years which is a huge amount out of the 50 year history of the church and uh, a great community man to the parish and very involved with fundraising and reading the church and the active retired group and uh, so I suppose it's sad that he's not here with us yeah, for the other Senate but I suppose the poor devil was spared all the, the anxiety of COVID-19 that, but it was certainly one that was highly revered and uh, very proud of St. Brendan's and very proud of his involvement here too. And decorated by the Pope? Decorated, yeah, he yeah. did a mm -hmm. medal, yeah. uh, which is uh, acknowledging his, his contribution to the community. And um, yeah, it were remarkable too, at the time of the, of the election, they were talking about the, um, the pension crisis. But I say, Paddy didn't help the situation because he was retired 31 years. Yes. So, and he was only working a bit longer than that. So it's yes. our, he certainly did, didn't, didn't help the yeah. argument. <laughs> but, uh, and the other benemerent that we had in the church, the benemerent is a papal medal to a lay person for their contribution to the community and to the parish. Is it the highest honour the church can bestow or is there something greater? Well, it is, it is up there with all of them anyway. Yeah, yeah, it, it is, it is, yeah. It was Paddy O'Connor, Paddy O'Connor and, and his wife Mary Ann who died Mary Ann died in November of last year, Paddy died on the 2nd of January. But uh, Paddy was a great stalwart in terms of fundraising for the church, did a huge amount of fundraising for Sister Concilio. They reckon about a million and a half he raised for Sister Concilio mm -hmm. on the work of, of Coon Verde. So people like that and there's many, many more. Mm -hmm. Bertie Conway sang the rosary for year in, year out. 
I'm doing it for the last two months, but I, I, I wrote to him lately, he said, I won't take your job off you, you can have it back. <laughs> but uh, people like that, okay. uh, they were great stalwarts to the parish and have really built it up over the years and created the memories and the blessings and the faith that, that we're, we're celebrating this time. <laughs> Uh, I'd wait till after the changes, it might be a job for a parish priest if the bishop changes his mind. <laughs> we last one of our priests that were here for a couple of years with us, Father, um, Michael, Fleming. Father Fleming. Michael Fleming. He was here with us for a couple of years as well, as a curate. And as was timely as well, Father Michael uh, was appointed in 1983, his brother to Sister Delord, our parish sister, and he was here for two and a half years, lived in the house across the road. And he was also a colleague at the time with Father Liam Comer, who passed away just a month ago as well. So ironic that Liam Comer was here as, as um, chaplain to the RTC at the time, but they were living that house together for two years, 83 to 85, as curates. And one of those years they were joined by Danny Broderick. So yeah. there's some more stories about that. It's, uh, shirts and socks went astray, but they were all, all wearing their, <laughs> each other's, but there were different times and they were all the same size. First off was best dressed. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, um, Liam w was moved in 1985 and Father Horgan came in 1985 as the first parish priest of the parish. He was here for 11 years until 96. Father Tom Lean for 11 years until 2007. Danny Broderick for two years after that. And then myself for the last 11 years as well. So 11 is a big number in all of those. Three 11s and, and a two. So. You don't want to, go, to, finish <laughs> off, to finish off, is Sean Hennepin ever going to get his vestments back? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we'll leave that for the sequel. <laughs> yeah. In 1970, when it all began, but it's certainly a milestone. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start again. I will. I will like Gabe Burnett at Trinity College. <laughs> <laughs>